Um, so our next speaker in here is uh, Carl Erickson from Atomic Object. Um, I had the opportunity to actually see him speak at the uh, SCNA conference, which is kind of the National Software Craftsmanship uh, Conference uh, in Chicago a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, and it happened actually at a really interesting time in my life. I had just started up a company, and Carl, you know, really, I thought, brought a lot of value, at least in my context, around building a company, you know, that, that caters to kind of the, the developer that we like working with. So I won't steal any more of this thunder. Carl? Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Hello. I'm uh, the co-founder. Is this too loud? Is it sounds loud to me? Are you okay? Okay. I'm a co-founder and the president of Atomic, as Todd Todd mentioned. And I wanted to say a quick word about the title of my talk. I have a personal concern and do a lot, uh, both personally and with the company, about the lopsided nature of of, um, in, of the number of women that are in our industry. And I think gender gender neutral language actually matters a lot. And I've been speaking and writing accordingly for years, but for some reason I've been a holdout on this craftsman and craftsmanship. And uh, sometime between when I agreed to do this talk and when I put these slides together, I decided that was dumb. So I have hacked the talk to be craftspeople and I'll try to stick to that. Um, since I'm gonna talk today about, uh, what I'm gonna talk today is stuff I've learned from um, building and running Atomic Object, then I thought it'd be good to give you a little bit of context for what Atomic is all about. So about half our revenue is from web development. Um, this is Bloomfire, a startup that came out of Kalamazoo, Michigan in the social learning space. They let you uh, create private libraries of content by easily capturing employee knowledge and then sharing that internally, video, uh, videos, screen capture, slide decks, things like that. They got acquired about a year ago, so that's a good story for them, and ended up in Austin, which is a bad story for Michigan, unfortunately. But we took them from a very ambitious but vague idea. Uh, they came and said, we want to we wanna revolutionize teaching and learning. That was the, where we started to a launch at South by Southwest a few years ago. We also do work in mobile. We build iOS and Android and occasionally even a BlackBerry app um, and some web mobile stuff. This is a showroom experience and education app for a company called Herman Miller, is commercial furniture company. And uh, about a quarter of our revenue is mobile. And the last quarter is actually a thriving agile embedded practice that we started about seven years ago when we were working on the software that talked to a new instrument for the company we were working with, and the, soft, the firmware was way far behind schedule and was typically very buggy. And uh, when in discussions with how we could help improve the situation, the firmware developer said, you can't test this. So that's like ra waving a, a red flag in front of a bull when it comes to atomic object developers to tell them you can't test something. And so we sat down and figured out how, do we go, how we'd go about doing TDD in embedded and as well as some other agile practices. Um, I didn't mention desktop. We do some desktop work. We're actually working on a really interesting desktop app and everybody loves it because it's such a, all of that nearly has been replaced by web, of course, so it's kind of fun to actually go back and build a, a desktop app in C Sharp. So that's about the company, what we do. Here's a little bit about me. I started Atomic in 2001 after teaching computer science for 10 years at Grand Valley State University, mid-sized school in the uh, state of Michigan in Grand Rapids. Um, a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to do some informal teaching again, uh, not in the classroom, uh, and I started this blog, Great Not Big. Um, the title uh, refers not to the absolute size of my company, but to the, where I believe your focus should be, uh, a focus of staying focused on being great, ironically brings pressures to, to get large. So what, you might reasonably ask, should you, why should you listen to me? Um, I have this company, I have this blog I've shamelessly plugged, but you know, why, why do I have something to share with you? So I thought I should tell you that. And one of our values at Atomic is transparency. So I'm gonna take advantage of that value and share some details about our company that usually aren't shared in th situations like this, I would say. And I think it helps you answer that question of what might Atomic Object have to learn from. At the very least, it gives you a little more context of where I'm coming from. So we have two offices. Uh, we're headquartered in Grand Rapids. That's the one on the top. And then we opened an office in Detroit last year, the first time we tried um, geographical expansion. We'll be 12 years old this summer. We employ 43 people, uh, not counting summer interns. 
we'll do right around $6.4 million in revenue this year. Believe it or not, uh, that puts, puts us at the 90th percentile by revenue of companies like ours. It's a, we live in, in an industry of uh, small companies. We've only had one unprofitable quarter in our history. Um, our profit margin is substantially higher than some of the industry benchmarks that I've collected. So there's some reasons that I think indi indicate that our model works pretty well. We've never laid anyone off for lack of work. We have let people go, but not for lack of work. And all of the people who work for us are employees. We don't use contractors at all. Maybe, most importantly, what you have to learn from me is the fact that Atomic has survived several difficult transitions. Uh, my co-founder left the company in 2009. That was an interesting experience. Good for him and good for us. Uh, we launched a new office last year. That's been a huge learning experience. Uh, we grew leadership from the developers internally and um, brought them up to be leaders, managers, and public facing in the company. We've grown from our very first offering in, the, uh, in 2001 and two, a little bit into three, was more of a staff augmentation sort of model where we didn't really have project responsibilities. We grew from that into having project responsibilities, budget and timing, et cetera. Um, and then from there, about five, six years ago, we started more and more working with what I would call product development responsibilities. So we brought design into our agile uh, dev practices, and that was a huge learning experience. We've also implemented our own, our own employee ownership plan. So as of today, Atomic Object is owned by 23 people, and 22 other people besides me own 47% of the company. We made our own plan up. So I think some interesting things there. A few years ago, I set myself a goal. I wanted the company to outlast my daily involvement. I'm 51. The average age of our company is something like 28, so there's a pretty big gap. Uh, and I wanted, I thought this would be a really a big accomplishment if I can make Atomic such that I don't have to be involved on a daily basis and it's healthy and happy and goes on. Um, obviously, I had to figure out a way to do that that didn't involve me. Um, I recently upped that goal uh, last year to, to having Atomic be the first 100-year-old software design and development consultancy. That's kind of a nutty thought, a 100-year-old software design and development company. And that would mean that we're around in 2101. The trouble with thinking about 2101 is God only knows. 2101 is a long way away. I don't know what it's going to be, what the world will be like. I couldn't even think about what sort of image I might use to represent 2101, as you can see. So I flipped it around. I said, as a sort of a thought experiment, what if Atomic was celebrating its 100th year anniversary this year? And instead of being the founder, I just happened to be the latest person to be running it. If I stopped in that 100th anniversary reflective mode and looked back and said, over the years, what are the attributes that have gotten this company to the 100 year mark? That was a question I had a little easier time answering. So I had one of my designers, or I mean, I went into the archive of the company's 100 year old history and I dug up an advertisement from 1901. This is what Atomic was advertising in 1901. So why have we survived for 100 years? It can't be the technology that we're using, clearly. You know, back then we used we manipulated steel and wood and electricity, this modern newfangled invention of electricity. It also can't be that we're a family business. Thank heavens the founder's children weren't interested in the business and so there wasn't that whole family succession planning difficulty. It definitely wasn't the founder because this guy's long gone, he's been dead for years. So instead I came up with these attributes. Financial, financially conservative business. If you're going to be around 100 years, you can't take a whole lot of risk because you're going to go through some hard times. You've got to be pretty conservative. You should also have some sort of a self-renewing internal ownership structure so that you don't go through a period of time when you lose control and ownership leaves the company. I think you also need to figure out how to govern yourself in a, success, in a sustainable way and also how leadership transitions and succeeds. I believe that you have to build into your company an ability to adapt. 100 years is too long, technology changes, markets change, customers change, the world changes. If you can't adapt, you're not going to survive. And then lastly, the point of my talk today, you need to create a good place for craftspeople to work for what we do. Every company needs three things, I believe. They need 
idea, execution, and culture. You gotta get those all right to make a good sustainable company. So I think that too much emphasis gets put on the idea typically. You see this particularly in, uh, in this culture of startups that we're all immersed in today. Um, you also have to execute really well, especially if you wanna be around 100 years. But I don't think idea and execution are enough, and I think that's where the third component of culture comes in. You need to create and nurture a powerful culture. Being a good computer scientist, I like to form abstractions. Um, and I was thinking about this, what sort of company is Atomic? Like, if Atomic is, is the object, what is the class? And I came up, uh, I thought about what, could, what would you call companies that are service companies and that help other companies create innovations? Because that's what we do. We make new products for companies. We establish new markets for them. We extend their products to do new things. So it's all about innovation. So I came up with a name, Innovation Services. Innovation services sell their expertise in, a, in, a, in innovation as a service. And because this is an abstraction, there better be more than one instance of it, and there are. I think we found, I found several in uh, product design, mechanical design, entertainment, special effects, environmental design. So there's other companies I think fit this category. I think it's all too common for uh, technical companies especially to conflate two things, um, their passion and their preference. So this is where you see like these endless silly flame wars like Ruby versus Clojure or PHP versus Rails. And I suspect that a common element of these innovation service firms are that they show a passion for their higher level concerns, things like quality and fit and predictability and maintainability and productivity and culture, and a preference for lower level concerns like languages, platforms, and tools. Those, I think that's a very important distinction. I believe that innovation services firms and software and the craft of software go really, really well together. They don't unfortunately have any leverage. You know, our business is an hour out and a dollar in. There's no financial leverage there at all. They also don't have an ex a way to exit particularly, although there's been an interesting phenomenon in the last few years of service firms being purchased, showing, I think, generally what the value of talent is at the moment. We, innovation service firms usually have two sorts of clients, either well-funded startups or really large companies that have the budgets to afford what we do. One of the things that makes an innovation service firm a challenging place to work is competition. You need to be significantly better than an, than an internal team, that's what you're oftentimes competing against, as well as better than your external competition. On the other hand, it's not the easiest way to make a living, but following the path of craftsmanship isn't taking the easy way out either. It's much more than building software uh, right, it's building the right thing. And software systems are naturally unconstrained, which actually makes our jobs harder than, say, a civil or a mechanical or electrical engineer. I believe our craft requires lifelong learning, lots of which is done on our own time. So these two go very naturally together, I believe. And it then becomes interesting to ask yourself the question, what sort of company might you put together to keep people who are software craftspeople happy and fulfilled and motivated? So we need happy and motivated teams of makers and companies. Makers is the term I use when I want to say designer and developer and tester and all of those roles, people who make software. Um, it turns out, just a little side note here, that it's really hard to get a natural picture of software development being done with people smiling. <laughs> I think it's because we're concentrating really hard and no one smiles when they concentrate. Or we're debating or we're discussing or whatever. So that's a real picture and that's as close as I can get to finding a smile. So how do we, how do we, get, these, how do we get satisfaction and motivation out of teams of makers? Do toys make us happy? Nerf, Nerf gun battles in the office? Anyone get really excited about that? Is it your title that makes you happy? I see silly titles nowadays. That must make some people happy. What about pizza parties? Fancy ergonomic chairs? These are the easy things, and I don't think they really actually do much for your motivation. Maybe we can just buy happiness. That would be much, much simpler. Money is very easy to manipulate. How many of you would be happier on Monday morning if your boss gave you a $10,000 raise? Unfortunately, the results of this large study that's been done 
show that you'd be happy for a very short amount of time and then you'd come right back down to whatever your little natural level of happiness is. Money is a great demotivator. If you're not being treated fairly, it's a lousy motivator. It doesn't make you happy. And in fact, the study that was done showed that it really has very little to contribute to your emotional well-being on a day-to-day -day basis after you make $75,000 a year. Anything above that and it doesn't do much for you. So we get, it wears off quickly. The best book I found on this subject is, is Daniel Pink's book, Drive. If you're not familiar with this, you certainly should be if you want to uh, understand how, what motivates people, which seems pretty important. So Pink differentiates between extrinsic motivations, such as money and intrinsic motivations. And his claim is that the intrinsic motivations are much more powerful. So he identifies three. Mastery, the opportunity to get better and to master your craft, very natural for us. Autonomy, people want to be able to control how they work, where they work, when they work, how they do it. And lastly, purpose, a belief in the work you do or an alignment with the mission of the company. This is, turns out to be the most challenging one for innovation services firms. I keep these in mind and we make darn sure that our policies and our practices are aligned with these things because I think it really helps. But there are also two that I've added because I think they're relevant to the goal of happy software developers in particular. So mastery, autonomy, and purpose, very abstract, very human, right from Daniel Pink. And I lo added love of craft and teamwork. And it gets, the reason I added these things is I believe that accomplishing something with other people is a great way to lead a satisfying life. Teamwork is knowing that someone's got your back and it's doing, being able to do more than you can do alone, having more effect in the world. It's a sense of camaraderie that keeps people happy and connected. I think the team is therefore the best unit of organization for a company of craftspeople. It's a project and hence client-centric. Teams work for clients. It focuses on the makers, teams of makers. And it's an alternative to the typical functional or hierarchical or product organization that a lot of companies use. So I wanted to share a little bit about our answer to the question of how you organize and run a company that might someday be 100 years old, because I think that's a good place to start. And this is how I think about it in my head. This is how it, how it looks to me. This is like the model of atomic object. By model, I mean what practices do we use? What concerns do we have? How do we arrange the company? What's the architecture of the company? And it's very uh, rich and complicated. It's an organic structure. It's interconnected. There are small elements. There are large elements. I think it's so complicated that no one really knows exactly how it works. Um, and I believe that the value of the total is greater than just summing up the elements. It's easy to pick any given element and question its value, in fact. You can also come up with perfectly reasonable alternatives. This isn't just there isn't just one way to do any of these things, and there certainly isn't just one model that works. All I can share with you is our model. So just one tiny example of what I mean by an element. One of the things that we've always done from the beginning of our company is pay everybody on an hourly basis, everybody. And that means that if you work 42 hours one week, you get paid for 42, and if you work 39 one week, you get paid for 39, everybody. And this strikes people as odd when they first join the company because they equate it with jobs in which you do not typically have the chance for mastery, autonomy, and you don't give a crap about the purpose of the organization. So they think about this as a bad thing somehow. But as it turns out, it works really, really well for us. And periodically, we look at it and when it doesn't work. Sometimes just keeping track of all of that time gets to be onerous. And so we consider, geez, maybe we should simplify our lives and just do the typical thing and have a salary model. But we've always come back to that hourly pay, which people love, by the way, and uh, works on so many other dimensions and interacts with so many other things in our company that changing it would just sort of be a gratuitous change. It might pick up a little benefit, but we'd be taking a big risk because you don't, I can't accurately predict what it'll do to the total model. So that's what I mean about any given element, like whatever, the way Atomic does it, the way Eighth Flight does it, it doesn't probably matter in that sense. But the way they work together, it matters a great deal. OK, so I've organized my talk into 20 elements in roughly three groups, people, generic attributes, and specific business practices. If I actually talked about all this stuff, I can see you're worried. 
we'd be here for a week. So I'm not going to do that. And please note, this is not a perfect taxonomy. Uh, there's overlap, and there's redundancy, and there's multiple membership. And in fact, I was reminded in Neil's keynote this morning, tagging would probably be much better for this than a nice little taxonomy. So I selected four to uh, focus on, and then I'll just open it up and you can ask me questions or we can stop. So the four I want to focus on are transparency, friendship, trust, and culture. And those things aren't business specific per se. They're not business practices, obviously. I believe instead what they are is the attributes of a company that make it a happy and fulfilling place for craftspeople to practice. There are business practices that support these things or undermine these attributes. And I'll talk about those and give you to make it concrete. So let's look at culture first. Culture is something every company has, whether you realize it or not, and whether you talk about it or not, whether you record it or not, it's there, which is an interesting thought. It should give you pause if you're a company leader and you've never thought about it, that something very, very important has developed over the course of time without your conscious thought. If you know why you're in business, and you've shared and clearly articulated your values, you'll find more alignment and easier recruiting and greater retention and a common purpose and a way of making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. It's very handy. To describe your culture, it helps to know why you exist. And your why might not be very obvious. Simon Sinek has talked about this idea of the company's or the organization's why. Every organization has these elements, he thinks. The what you do, um, we build software applications. That's our what. It's very straightforward. The how you do it, oh, iteratively, test-driven, in pairs, with rails, blah, 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 blah. Can rattle off that stuff for a long time. Customers, unfortunately, never care. And then there's the why. Why does your organi organization exist? I believe that this why is very closely related to Daniel Pink's third element of motivation, which is purpose. The trick with an innovation services firm, software craftsmanship firm, is that it's hard to articulate the why without talking about what it is we do. And that's where that love of craft really comes in. We like making great software and finding better ways of doing it. I believe that's Atomic's why. Now, when our teams are operating for, uh, in a team on a project for a client, we temporarily pick up the purpose or the mission or the why of our client. And I see this happening because I see my designers and developers and testers acting in some ways more in the interest of the client than an atomic object. They'll fight for resources for the client, for their project, for their team. They jealously guard their budget. They optimize for the outcome for the project and the client, not for the, out, the optimizing for atomic. Seems kind of crazy, but it tells me that that's what's going on. So we're sort of symbiotic with our clients. Whatever their purpose is, healthcare, or is it automotive, or is it education, for the duration of that project, we pick up their purpose and their why, at least the team does. And that's why our why, our true internal why, sounds like I'm getting confused in the what and the how. One of the ways that we uh, express our culture is through something I call value mantras. These are like shorthand words, kind of like pattern names, for things that we hold dear. It helps us talk explicitly about culture without rambling and rambling. We use them, I would say, daily basis. And by use them, I mean it helps us make business decisions, it helps us set expectations, it helps us hire, helps us decide about facilities. So I'll just share them with you. The first one is give a shit. This is very useful when it comes to hiring. We look really, really hard for people who care. They care about themselves, they care about their profession, they care about their craft, they care about the company, they care about their colleagues and their clients. People who don't give a shit aren't very fun to work with. They might be a little easier to work with at times, but it's not very satisfying. Second value mantra, share the pain. Not every project is the most exciting, not every uh, 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 daily work assignment is the most interesting or challenging. Let's not lump those all on one person. Let's share, let's spread that out. Another great example of our share the pain mantra is in the area of marketing. We use something uh, that I would call like thought leadership marketing, which is to say we don't advertise per se. We just uh, share with the world how we do things. So we blog a lot, for example. Everybody in the company blogs. 
And everybody in the company blogs because that blog is actually quite good at bringing us hires and occasionally work. Um, not everybody loves to write. Not everybody loves to blog. In fact, some people find it quite painful. So rather than picking on a few people to participate in the company blog, we set it up so that everybody has to blog approximately every 30 days. Share the pain. Teach and learn. The learn part's obvious. We don't specialize in one tech stack or one industry, so we're learning new things all the time or we wouldn't survive. But the teach part isn't quite so obvious. Um, our blog is actually another example of the teaching and learning because I think it really helps uh, all of our people to learn more about what they're doing by having to write it down in an intelligent blog post. So we find ways of teaching and learning a lot. And we expect that whatever you learn as an individual, you're bringing back into the company to teach it and to share. The fourth mantra is own it. I want a culture of ownership in a company in the sense of you see a problem, you fix it. You have an issue, you raise it. There's a hard conversation to have with a customer, you have it early. You take out the trash because it needs to be taken out. And that's not your job, but whatever. That's the sort of exemplifying own it. I've literally exemplified it myself with this employee ownership plan that is diffusing ownership into the full-time employees of the company. The fifth value mantra is actually the one we've added most recently, and that was just, I think, about last year, actually. It was, and that's act transparently. Act transparently is ironic to be added fifth because it's something that's, this idea of transparency is something that's very, very uh, critical to Atomic, and you can find it in our, all of our external facing business practices as well as our internal practices. And I think it's the one that we added last and didn't realize it was there because in the same way that a fish probably doesn't realize it's swimming in water. It's just so part, so such a natural part of the company that we didn't, didn't think to put it in the list. A big part of culture is how we organize the work that we do. Our model is co-located, poly-skilled, self-managing teams of makers. You can tell I've probably said that a few times. So co-located is we believe it's important to be together, so we have a building for each office. We like this idea of poly-skill. We don't want specialists. We want uh, a, a generalists. Self-managing means we organize the architecture of the company as the team plugged into a client to do a project, and that's it makes for a very flat company. And those are teams of makers. We don't have account managers and project managers, non-makers. When we were small, changing project assignments just sort of naturally mixed people up together. And by small, I mean up to probably 10, 15 people. So everybody knew everybody else. Good chance you'd work with somebody during the course of a year. As we grew, that was no longer true. That was no longer enough. So last year, we invented this idea called pair lunch. You're all familiar with pair programming, I would assume. This is pair lunch. Pair lunch is the company has two simple rules. It's got to be a pair of people. Company buys the lunch, and you can't do it more than once a month with any single other person. So with those simple set of rules, announce this to the office, and then let's see what happened. What you're looking at, which is pretty much completely not visible, on that projector is the nodes are people and the lines connecting them are lunches. And with this projector, it looks like no one had lunch with anyone else, unfortunately. The little lines that connect the nodes, there are very rich, many, many, many connections. Lots of people having lunch with lots of different people. And I consistently heard this from people, how happy they were like, oh, I went and had lunch with Joe and we talked about his kids and we talked about where he went to school and what you know, ideas he has for some blog post. And I never would have known any of those things if I hadn't gone out to lunch. And I have no reason to go out to lunch with Joe, but Pear Lunch gave me a reason to walk up and say, hey, Joe, let's go out to Pear Lunch. It's worked really, really well. We've done 228 Pear Lunches in the first year. And that, I figure, sort of back of the envelope is maybe 450 hours of people talking to each other outside of a project, outside of the company, just on a personal social level. Great for, for making bonds. The other thing we do is, um, this is a few years old now, has had honestly had mixed success, is we assign a culture pair to every new hire. So this is kind of like the pair programming idea again, let's do it with culture. So everybody gets a culture pair, and that person's in charge of answering the dumb questions that all new hires have. 
They're also in charge of going and sort of poking their nose into the other person's business to making sure they're getting along okay and making sure that they're picking up the culture, making sure that they're um, doing things the way we expect things to be done. I mentioned uh, act transparently. Our fifth value mantra is the most recent ad. And that's, I think, because transparency is such a big part of what we do. There are at least four dimensions of this. You can find it all over the place. But I see it in facilities, in our business practices, how we interact with clients, and then how we work on projects. And I believe it's really important and powerful if you align all of those things. So you can't be transparent in one dimension and opaque on another. I think that would be bad. I think that loses a lot of power. Having alignment is, is really good. So for example, facilities can be open while being very closed. I happen to live in the region, West Michigan, where the open office was invented. And I'm really sorry about that. As I'm sure any of you who have worked in these environments knows, cubes like this combine the worst aspects of private offices and one big room. They tend to be sterile and isolating and unhuman and neat and clean and orderly in contrast to this picture from our office, which is messy and crowded, sometimes noisy, highly collaborative, informal and human. Big difference. And I don't think it's too hard to see, even without the people in the cube picture, which one sort of plugs into the humanness of us more nicely. So this environment spreads knowledge. It lets you know what other, other people are doing, accidental conversations. Makes it impossible to hide. It's been my experience that people who aren't working out at Atomic oftentimes will self-select out because everyone knows they're not working out. They're not pulling their weight. They don't share our values. Their quality, commitment to quality isn't what ours is. And so they find ways of moving on, oftentimes self-correcting errors. It also makes it really easy to ask for help instead of struggling them all, all, all on your own. I think your business practices should be open and transparent as well. We've practiced something called open books management since I started the company in 2001. In fact, I invented the idea of open books management. Anyone going to call me on that or laugh? This is too bad because what it tells me that you're not all laughing at me is that not enough people know about this idea. I found out years later that a guy named John Case also invented this idea of open books management way before I had done it, the early 90s. I was so excited until I found that out. What, what open books management means is that every employee understands the financial model of the company and has the data on the state of the company and knows how his or her work impacts the company. And we take this beyond just finances. We take this to everything. You should understand the company. You should be able to know what the state of the system is at any point in time and know how your work is going to impact it. So because my experience with developers and designers, makers, is that they don't generally learn anything about business or, or economics in school, I started a class called the Economics of AO. And we do this for all new employees, and we encourage anybody who wants a refresher to come to this class as well. So at a, sorry, I was off by one. At a quarterly meeting, we also review the profit and loss statement and the sales pipeline and all of our marketing efforts and share what the, obviously what the profit is that we're going to be sharing with everybody, both for employees and for owners. Everything's uh, open and available. And then we also take that idea and say, well, once a quarter is great, but it's not, very, it's not frequently enough to like, see how my actions today impact the bottom line of the company. So for financial transparency and open books management, we use some dashboard radiators. This is a relatively new effort. And it's a little embarrassing to show because it's so it's got some issues. Um, one of the challenges, I was talking with Todd before, um, before this about being software developers and being busy is you always prioritize your clients and never your own internal tooling needs. So had, finally had a little bit of spare cycles over the winter and, and got some progress in this, but it has other things it needs. So what this does is it's actually on, t on a giant television hanging out in the middle of the office. Um, the far right-hand side helps everybody understand where they are in that blogging cycle I was describing. So if you have a big, tall green bar, it means you've blogged recently and you're really good. And then if you have a little, uh, shorter yellow bar, it means you should be thinking about what your next blog post is because it's coming up. 
and God forbid you turn red, and that means you're past due, and that's not good. No red on there today. The white part at the bottom here is a product called Chartbeat, which is a snapshot of who's reading our blog or is on our website right now at this moment. It's like the snapshot Google real-time Google Analytics, I believe. Only it came about before that, which is why we use it, not the real-time GA. This turned out to be a really valuable thing to get people to buy into the, the, the power of blogging. Like, oh, it's really exciting when you put a blog post out there and you see a couple of hundred people reading it right now this morning. Um, and then the top one is the most recent ad. Oh, sorry, top left corner is uh, some CI stats about how many projects are in, uh, are in this particular system and which ones are passing and failing. The one in the middle, the top middle, is the most recent ad, and that's the one that needs the most work visually. That's a two-dimensional key performance indicator, to use the fancy management term, or KPI. So there, the vertical dimension is utilization, billable utilization. How much of my work is billable for the current quarter? We reset it every, every quarter. So for the current quarter, what's my average billable utilization? And instead of taking the number that, you know, is what you would get if you take our 20, 80 hours or 5, 12 hours and a quarter and subtract out vacation and subtract out being sick and subtract out having a baby and subtract out uh, working on internal company things. We do all that subtraction for you and figure out what's the actual uh, feasible amount of billable hours that you could get. So 100% utilization is not impossible to do. And in fact, if you're not working on something internal, that's probably what you are. So then we show it on a graph that shows your difference between hitting 100% and not. So at the very bottom, you're 25% below that, and then you can be a little bit above that too. I think it goes up to 10 or 20 points above that. And then the dimension, the horizontal dimension, the x-axis, is the difference between the hours, that total hours you've worked, and the number of hours there are in a 40-hour work week. We believe really strongly in sustainable pace, and we have a really good record in this regard. And uh, one thing that made us nervous about radiating this sort of information was, you know, we don't want this to become a race for billable hours. Luckily, I don't have that problem. Our culture is very not that way in terms of, uh, even though people are getting paid by the hour, you think you might, that might support or encourage that. It doesn't seem to happen. So this has been very helpful to just let people know, geez, if I'm in the upper right corner, I'm doing a lot of billable work, and I'm working at least a full-time job, good. If I'm in the left lower corner, not so good. I'm not even working a full-time job, and what I'm doing isn't billable. And if I'm a maker, I'm probably mostly supposed to be billable. The bottom right corner is the most interesting quadrant, and that's where I wanted this radiator, because that means you're, you're working a full-time job, that's good, but you're also doing things that aren't billable. And I, very important things usually, I want people to stop and think about that. What am I working on right now? I'm working on a presentation. Well, is this presentation gonna be more valuable to the company than me doing another few hours of billable work? That's the kind of question I wanna get asked. And that's the kind of conversation that this radiator has engendered very nicely. Um, transparency also is particularly important between clients and teams. I'm sure many of you use burn charts. Burn chart is not only a handy little lightweight project management tool, but a burn chart in your uh, base camp project every week is a really nice way to share with the client early on where things stand. So there's no hand waving, no avoiding hard discussion, full transparency. I think craftsmen should know, craftspeople should know for whom they are working. They should have an emotional connection to that person. And I think clients should know that there are people creating their software. It's not just some company somewhere in some office and it's faceless. So connecting the company, connecting the clients who are the people with a, their craftspeople, I think, is very, very important. We also radiate project status from our various CI servers. So that's showing a few red boxes, a few broken tests, and it all goes up to a traffic light that hangs out in the middle of the space, uh, which makes it all very visible. So lots of transparency, lots of business practices that support that or implement that. Social connections are another common element of companies that are built for craftspeople, I believe. And friendship actually is an interesting thing because you can find plenty of management books that tell you you should discourage friendship and fraternization and, and social relationships within the company. Um, and I think that 
whether or not you like the idea, social connections or friendships are going to arise in companies that are small, that have shared values, and that solve problems together. This is what makes people become friends. So investing yourself socially at work has some risks associated with it. It's multiple eggs in one basket, so to speak. Um, but it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And that because of those shared values, common goals, et cetera. Since innovation service firms are intense places to work, we create intentional time to be social and have fun and blow off steam. And there's lots of ways that this happens. So we have, for example, a monthly spin down party where we invite, of course, employees, but spouses and kids and people we might want to hire and friends of the company and occasionally a customer. It came out of an early habit that we developed on Friday called Free Beer Friday, where I would go or my partner would go and just buy some beer and we'd sit around the office at the end of the day on Friday, not worrying about customer projects and just talking and drinking beer, a chance to bond and share stories. And then a friend of mine, a more savvy business friend of mine, uh, pointed out to me that there was significant liability associated with doing this when everyone got in their cars and drove home. Um, so we talked to the lawyer, and then we got a little bit worried about that. And remember the whole conservative financial bias? We realized, hey, you know, there are people in the world who are insured against this risk. They're called bartenders. So now we just bring bartenders in, spend a little bit more money to do it, and uh, formalize it a bit. And it's different than Free Beer Friday was, but it's a lot of fun. We still get the bonding, significant others, kids come over, customers and friends occasionally. That one's run by the company, paid for by the company, very formalized uh, in the sense that it's scheduled. There are a lot of other things that happen that aren't that way. They're just organized outings or sporting events. So for example, last year a bunch of us took a 75 mile round trip bike ride to a microbrewer on the lakeshore. It was very fun getting there and drinking the beer. It was not so fun riding back. We do those kind of things quite a bit. And while I did participate in this one, I didn't organize it. And I don't think the company paid, maybe. I don't even really remember. It was just sort of spontaneous. We go out to events. I think this is a Tigers game. The fact that I don't even know what it was is, makes me really, really happy. Because these aren't mandatory. You don't have to show up. They're self-organizing. And there's a lot of different ones. They're very diverse. To celebrate our 10th anniversary, we took the whole company up to this historic inn in, on Lake Michigan with our spouses. That was not only a lot of fun, but it let, us, it let the people who had been in the company for a long time tell stories in a, in a, you know, in a way that everybody was listening to the people who had, re, who had joined us that year. And that helped build the culture and, and strengthen existing bonds and build some new ones. Um, we've always encouraged spouses to consider themselves a part of the company and to participate. And I've been even more lately working on that. We're, sharing financials with, with spouses, encouraging them to come to the business part of the meeting as well as the party part of the meeting that follows the quarterly meeting. Um, it's, I see this as extending sort of a family model. We've got something on Facebook now. Uh, spouses can subscribe to our internal newsletter. And I find it's very important for, to make that connection to them, to know those people and to um, find out, just sort of use them as a canary to see how people are feeling, what stress levels are. The last element of the model that I wanted to touch on of those four is trust. And by the way, trust is a really hard thing to come up with images to illustrate. So you're looking at it. Um, I see multiple layers of trust in our model. There's the trust that employees have in the owners to treat them fairly, to share the gains of the collective work, to shepherd the company responsibly, to make good decisions. There's the trust exhibited between colleagues on a team to pull their weight, to share the pain, to do good work, to not sully the reputation jointly. There's trust that the leaders have in their employees and teams to fulfill the expectation of clients. There's the trust that clients have their teams work hard and deliver as much value as they can and maintain quality while doing so. There's the trust that the team has in the clients to allow them to do their work professionally and not to blame them for things that no one could uh, anticipate or for a client to try to tell the team how to do their work. One of the reasons that growing these kinds of companies is difficult is that it's difficult to scale trust. And I think that's a real challenge when it comes to size. It's one of the things that led us to say atomic object in Grand Rapids in the 30-ish people range is a really good number and it shouldn't get bigger than that. With enough demand and interest and wanting to create value, we said, let's try it somewhere else. And that's why we went to Detroit. Trust is earned very slowly, and it can be destroyed very quickly. 
Transparency has a really interesting interaction with trust. It creates the opportunity to build trust. It keeps you honest, so to speak, when as a leader, you might be tempted for the sake of expediency, and I still am, to do something that could undermine trust. You have to really understand that. And if you're operating in a transparent fashion, in a transparent environment, even when you have that little devil on your shoulder tempting you to say, well, we can just do this. It's going to be a lot faster. I don't have to get everyone to understand this. No one will know. Being transparent says, nope, not going to work. You're going you're gonna to have to do it the hard way. And that, in turn, builds trust up. So these are the common elements that I found. I talked about four, four of them. Transparency, culture, trust, and friendship. I would be happy to stop here, or I'd also be happy to take questions, or we could have a discussion. We have mics up here for questions, too, if people want to ask questions. Or you can just speak loudly, too. Yep. What are, can, you, can you talk a little bit about governance and how, you, how that value applies to your business? So governance is an issue uh, that, not a value, but a business practice that we're still, um, still re refining. One of the things that is very important about our model is that it can actually grow and adapt. We do things very differently now than we did 10 years ago, that's for sure. And governance is an example of that. So we, our first form of governance was benign dictatorship, me. And we're in the process of transitioning from benign dictatorship to a board, internal, um, an advisory board of senior atomic people, all of whom also happen to be owners. Uh, it's eight people, and those people meet once a month. And we come, we being the, the, the leaders of the company, the, the people who manage the company, who do sales work and capacity planning and strategic thinking and marketing work mostly, we come to the board for advice and consent. I use that word, which I think uh, is what the Senate does for the presidential appointments, because it's not a straight vote, and I don't have to have the approval of the board per se, but I really want to tap their perspective and opinions and ideas. And it's part of, because it's a very active board, because it's full-time employees and it's the senior employees, they're also responsible in the consensus way we operate for helping to implement what it is we collectively decide. So we're shifting towards that sort of a governance model. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, so my question is from, and look, I missed it again, so I apologize if you already answered this. And That's okay. If you did, then it would probably be a really fast answer, because everybody else will refer. Um, and looking at the list of words, um, I see architecture. Um, but I don't see anything about uh, software and enabling craftspeople to improve their level of skill um, and just get better at their craft. Um, what What do you guys? Uh, what's it like at uh, Atomic Object from that perspective? Like, what's it What's it feel like? What, how would you know if you were talking to people there that um, that craftsmanship was in the culture from a software development perspective? Great question. Um, that, that ability to, to gain mastery is a, criti a critical part of what I think motivates people, per Daniel Pink. And we have many practices that encourage that. So part of that is, what project do you get to work on? And, and thinking about that from a in the capacity planning problem of how are we going to handle this project, I also, we also give consideration to who needs to learn to do this sort of work? Who wants the opportunity? Who wants to, the opportunity to do more of what they've been doing to get tr closer to mastery? We spend a lot of money on professional development. We encourage professional, we expect professional development invested in their own uh, employees' own time, but we also support that with tools and books and travel very generously. Um, part, of our, uh, part of what I think where mastery comes from is, not, uh, is being, being organized into co these self-managing co-located teams of makers that are um, poly skilled teams of makers that are directly connected to the customer. And so you feel you're not just like a little cog where you just do your one little thing. You're getting better all the time because you're, you're challenged as a generalist to learn you know, about the client's domain and their business concerns and managing that, that relationship, setting expectations, communicating your work, um, blogging about what you've learned, writing that way, teaching and learning. I think all of these things contribute to getting better as a craftsperson. We have a very deeply ingrained uh, uh, belief in quality. We came out of this test-driven development um, practice, which is 
probably the single thing I couldn't get anyone to change, even if I wanted to. I just couldn't get people to not do that. So quality is a very important factor uh, of all of our projects. And that encourages people to not only get better at what they do, but figure out um, different ways of validating. Validation is another aspect of this. We validate you know, our business assumptions. We validate our design assumptions. We validate our code. We do usability testing. We write things that validate that the hosting setup is correct. Like Validation is another element, I believe, that puts an emphasis on quality and mastery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in your business model, like, uh, do you really work more on kind of turnkey projects, or you're kind of co-located with your clients? No, we started out more co-located with clients, and after a couple of years, we started consciously moving it towards what I call the project model, which is we're working in our facility and we have full project responsibility, and we might start in ideation, or we might start with a pretty well-defined idea, but we're running the project in the sense of there's a budget and we're uh, doing design and development and deployment, and we're delivering the whole thing all the way out to the end. I think that's actually another part of the mastery business too, is just being working in that sort of environment. Makes you responsible. With the second office, uh, what uh, is gonna be the biggest challenge for one of those words up there, say trust or governance? So <clears throat> the the realization that we have had recently, and, and to be honest, this count comes after starting the second office in Detroit, is that the model works really, really well, and I don't know why, but I should be very hesitant to mess with the model. And so some of the things we did in Detroit, almost all the things we did in Detroit are very in sync with the model, but we made some changes. And looking at it now with the perspective of 12 months of um, hindsight, I think some of the changes that we made probably weren't a great idea. So just as one example of that, um, because we have 35 people working in Grand Rapids and generating a lot of, of profit, we could plant Detroit with um, a desire or a mandate to grow more quickly than they would otherwise be able to grow organically with local connections to customers and, and sort of their, you know, your own local hiring. Atomic grew organically by keeping two forces in balance. One was hiring the right people and word of mouth happy clients. and just. You know, both of those went up sort of roughly in step. With Detroit, we have the option, because of the profit we generated out of Grand Rapids, to do something different than that. That's not the model, and I'm honestly worried about that. Another example would be um, radiating the information. Uh, our, our information radiators that hang out in the office are the identical in the two offices, which seems smart. But on the other hand, I've got people in Detroit who've only worked there for a few months who are looking at statistics and data and finances for this much bigger thing of which they are a tiny part. That doesn't seem very smart to me in hindsight. So I think there's some refactoring we need to be doing on that. Uh, yes, hi. If you could speak uh, just a little bit about maybe how your values and the culture you've, you, you, you know, crafted over time, how do you recruit into that culture? Uh, is there any insight in kind of how you approach that so that you're finding people that fit well with it or are willing to embrace it? Yeah, it's uh, relatively easy to figure out technical strengths. We do pair programming exercises. We have people work on a, um, before they even come in for an interview, they, they have an assignment they do over the weekend in a time-limited fashion in closure. Um, it's much harder to figure out good culture match and value match. And one of the things that I found is helpful is get a lot of people's perspectives and opinions on it. So our hiring process is very broad in that a candidate will talk to many people within the company. And at the end of those interview days, the, everyone who talked to the candidate comes together in a stand up and we, sometimes that's five, 10 minutes and sometimes it's an hour. It's a pretty bad sign when it's an hour usually. And so we'll share our different perspectives on what we heard and what we think, because ultimately it's just a value, it's just a, I don't want to say it's a guess, but it's not something that you can give someone a personality test or a technical test and figure out, are they a good match to atomic values culture? And sometimes we make mistakes and have to correct it, which is usually unpleasant. So we don't like to, I don't like doing that. Um, the other element uh, about this is I make it really clear to the people we're considering hiring 
that it is their responsibility, as much as it is mine, to figure out if this is a good match. Take advantage of our transparency, I tell candidates. Ask me whatever you want to ask me. OK, I'll leave the room. Now ask the employees whatever you want to ask me. Ask them. Dig and investigate and ponder and be honest with yourself whether this is a good match for you. Um, some practices, like the, the fact that we work in a big, big room and there's a lot of pairing going on, you know, that's something we want to give them actual experience with, which is why we bring them in for a day of pairing, because sometimes that's not a good match. But we work really hard to try to figure out the answer to that question. And we will stretch and take a risk on someone who's a good value match and a good culture match, who doesn't have the exact, uh, I don't really care actually about technical background now that I say this, but somebody who's like right out of school, for example, who doesn't have much experience, that's a good hire for us if it's a good value and culture match. Uh, I was wondering how uh, work-life balance matches into you know, the culture that you're talking about. Um, one of the things that I saw, and I've been pitched this kind of thing before, is you know that there's there's events that kind of uh, everybody just kind of gels together. You know, we all go hang out, we you know we go to a ball game, or you bring the kids in. And and honestly, from my point of view, uh, I typically and maybe this is just an indication I'm not a good fit. I typically keep my, my work and the rest of my life separate. I have a lot of other things that I do. I love the job that I have, and I love the work that I do, but I've also got you know a side business, two kids, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm curious as to how that matches into what you describe as culture. I, that's a great question, by the way. I, um, one of the things that I'm very keen on is that these things that we do together, these opportunities there are to interact outside the office, never become mandatory. They're always optional. There's a lot of participation in them, but it's not because you need to or you have to. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. And not everybody participates. So we accommodate, and I've seen it happen over time, especially as um, when we started the company, um, our, um, our first three employees were, were still students. We have these three apprentices at the university I taught at previously. And so they were, I don't know, 21 or two or something. They were very young. And then for quite a while, there were a lot of young single people in our company. That has shifted, because we retain people, shifted dramatically. There's been a lot of weddings. There's been a lot of um, babies. I get my, my baby fix. My babies are 21 and 18 now. So I get my baby fix by having people bring their babies to the office. It's quite nice. So that changes, you know, that puts a lot more load on your life outside of, of your work and outside of your craft. And we have grown naturally and accommodated that, I think, very smoothly and, and very well. I personally don't like the term work-life balance because I think it sets up this false dichotomy that I do this thing at work, probably for money, and then I have like the rest of my wonderful rich life outside. Not what you were saying, I understand. But I just had this beef about that term. And the way I look at it is, if what you're doing for work doesn't satisfy and fulfill you, well, good luck being a happy person, because most of us as adults have to work roughly half our waking hours. So that's a big chunk of your life. And if you can't get satisfaction out of it, that's not going to be very cool. Again, I realize that's not what you were saying. But, but yeah, I think we've done a good job of balancing that. And people can participate as their life allows. I think you kind of answered this question I was going to ask a little bit, but can you go that way? You said you, know, you had a good retention ratio in your company, but my question was in terms of what's the turnover over the last 10 years that you've had in terms of people who have come and gone. And, uh, you know, uh, and also is that when you talked about making this process of hiring people a little more elaborate and they come in and you have a bunch of people that they need and things like that, but what if there was a situation where you signed up on a project and you're taking over some undertaking, and then you discover a few things as you begin to work on it, and you have a budget and a time constraint, and you gotta meet it, and you don't have the skill set that you gotta bring in somebody to be able to finish that. And when a company is looking to grow and prosper, you're in a lot of situations like that. So how do you how do you manage that with the element of some of the beliefs that you have? Because I hear I like what you're saying, but then in terms of you know applying it, how does that work? So it's basically two point four. I'm going to answer the second one, which means you'll probably have to remind me what the first one was. But um, organic growth is part of our model. And, and that means we're hiring people as 
we find good people to hire and as we think that we'll have work to support them, you never get, are guaranteed. So I have a different problem to solve than somebody in a large corporation where you're told that these are the projects you have to get done this year, you know, staff appropriately to get them done. We take projects on because we have people available. So it's a, it reverses that. So I never find myself in, a, in the position of taking, having taken a project on and needing to hire to do it. I won't do that. We won't commit to a client unless we're sure we have capacity to do it. This wouldn't save me if I had a high degree of turnover, because I might get surprised. I might take a project thinking I had capacity and people, and then they leave. Then I could get surprised in the way I think you're talking about. But because we have good retention and happy makers, we don't have, that doesn't happen. Ah, I remembered the first question. Our retention over the course of 10 years, or 12 years, uh, my, my partner, my co-founder and my partner left in the summer of 2009 because he is, he's one of the most brilliant programmers I've ever known. I had him as a student. That's how we got to be friends. Um, and he's also uh, the sort of person that doesn't optimize for anything in his life other than what makes him satisfied and happy and interested. And his interests had drifted to law, believe it or not. So the software craftsperson world loss, a very, very talented developer, and the lawyers gained somebody. And he just graduated from law school last year, actually. I mean, just this last month. So he left and to pursue that, and that was a happy thing. We lost uh, two people of, of their own choice um, two years ago to PhD programs. One went off to NYU, one went to Michigan State. The second one told me when we hired him in January, a former apprentice, he said, look, I'm going to go to grad school. I said, great, Joseph, but hang out with us for six months and work on projects and be part of the team. And he said, okay. So we knew we were going to lose him. We recruited internally for one of our senior developers to go become the, essentially the CTO of a company that we had uh, jointly created with a partner. So we lost him because we pulled him out. And that might be it. Now, there have been people we've let go. And I think this is a really interesting thing when you look at retention statistics. If I saw a company that had perfect retention in terms of only, you know, people, maybe like the ones I just described to you, people leave voluntarily, a, a relatively low level of that, and no involuntary um, leaving, I would be really, really worried because it would imply to me either you are perfect in your hiring process, which I don't believe anyone can be, or you're afraid of making tough decisions. You're not protecting your client's interest or your culture or your company. And, and, you're, and you're finding ways to allow the dead wood to build up or the inappropriate cultural matches to stay. And that says to me, you've got not much of a commitment to your company. So we have had turnover in that regard, but it usually comes in the time range of like three to six months. Since you said everybody is uh, working at an hourly rate, uh, do you have any concerns or issues with cash flow predictions? Like month to month? Uh, no. We, um, one of the things I had to learn, you know, you have three degrees in electrical engineering and they never teach you anything about business. So I had a lot to learn going from professor to, to business person. And one of the things I had to learn was, oh, wow, it's really interesting. We're growing, we're doing good work, and suddenly we don't have any cash. And, and that, that was in 2002 or three, probably. I had that experience. So having learned that and survived it, uh, became very savvy about financial buffers, rainy day funds, et cetera. Um, the, hourly doesn't, the hourly itself doesn't impact variability in that regard at all, because people generally work 40 hours, plus or minus two. I work a few more than that, but not really that much more. I think I probably average 47, 48 a week. And all of our makers average in the 42 range per week. And that's counting blogging time and everything. So it, the, as far as like the cost of people goes, it's very, it's very predictable. It's nice to know, for example, that saying, paying people hourly because it's fair and open and transparent doesn't cause them to like grab as many hours as they can and work, which would cause this problem you're pointing out. And I think it's because we've successfully created a culture and hired people that match that culture where money isn't their prime motivator. It's not the first thing. 
On the other hand, it has a very nice positive effect, this hourly pay, because in the rare event that we screw a project up, I can't sort of make it up on the backs of my employees by telling them to work overtime to give the customer more time or to rebuild something that we might have messed up. I, I couldn't do that even if I wanted to, or, or I couldn't do that without incurring financial costs to the company. So the company's gonna pay for those mistakes if we, in the rare event that we, I'd want someone to work overtime. Luckily it doesn't happen, so I don't have to worry about it. That's okay, I'm giving you that one. Okay. <laughs> How do you bring about change? How do you approach change in your organization? Because it's hard to convince people sometimes. Sometimes you have to dictate change to them. You know, especially if it's coming from bottoms up, it's, it might be hard for a person at the lower level to change or to bring change. How do you approach that? Yes, it, I think one of the, both the strength and, the, and a downside of a strong culture is it becomes inherently resistant to change. So it was easier to change things 10 years ago than it is now, for example, for sure. Um, so part of that is a reason to stay smaller, I believe, because um, I think the larger it gets, the bigger that problem would get. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to people, and we, we take longer to make decisions than we would if we were just running by fiat. Um, we have a lot of channels for Communication and input, having a high degree of trust, I think helps in that um, I can do things and I can say things and, I, and people believe me. So that's a, a useful thing to get people to steer the ship and to get change to happen. But at the same time, I have to admit, it is something that's frustrating. When I see an opportunity that requires some change or I think we should try something new, there can oftentimes be resistance. And I, can, I personally will feel occasionally that, um, that the, there are people in the company whose job it is, it is to be restless and aware and tuned into clients and tuned into the market and tuned into what's happening and making or doing small experiments and making changes um, to accommodate what's happening in the world. And if you have someone like that pushing in that pushing for those things, then it allows some people to take the opposite, to go the opposite end of the spectrum and just resist and be negative and be fearful and uncertain and doubting. And that can really get me down sometimes as a leader, I have to admit. And so the last time this happened, we were talking about a, a pretty significant new strategic business initiative. And I got that sort of reaction from a, a lunchtime um, discussion that I was having. I got a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And uh, I took that as a, a sign of like, hey, wait a minute, guys, I guess you, you, you don't trust me in this regard or you don't have respect for what I'm seeing and what I'm saying. And it really bummed me out. So I came back the next morning at stand up and talked about that, about my feelings about, in that regard. And about, you know, part of, if, you're, if all you can see is the negative and, the, and be fearful and resistant to change, then you basically are taking yourself out of the conversation. You're not gonna get a chance to participate and we're going to lose out on your perspective, and that's a real bummer. And that turned into a really interesting discussion at stand-up that came down to a smaller group of maybe 10 people and went on for an hour uh, one morning. So every problem that I have run into, the answer usually has something to do with go back and talk about it. Talk, talk about it, be open, be transparent. Even when you're transparent and it drives you nuts, the answer is be more transparent, which I only say half-jokingly. Thanks, um, I hope it's been interesting for, us, for me to share. I have three suggestions to leave you with. Having listened to this, you could bring some of these ideas into your own company or team. And I say team because maybe you work for a big company and you can only affect local stuff, so that's, don't give up. Um, if that is hopeless and you like these ideas, find one of these companies to work for. There are companies that have these values and operate this way. Atomic's certainly not the only one, though we are hiring in Detroit, by the way. And then lastly, start your own. I think making more companies for craftspeople is doing the world a good favor in the sense that you have value being created, people living happy, satisfied lives, um, the value of craftspersonship, I really don't like that word, the, the value of the craft of, our, of, our, of software being promulgated is a good thing. And I think it helps the economic competitiveness of our companies. These kind of companies are incubators for talent. They are holders of standards. They help 
other companies create innovation, and that's obviously very important economically. So you're doing a good thing if you start your own. Thanks. <laughs>